they're special and maybe we'll, maybe you'll even care about them a little bit. That's my hope. But conservation, it really does take collaboration. It takes so many partners. I think folks in um, rural, rural communities probably understand that better than anybody else. And we really need to pull together because nobody has enough money, nobody has all the skills, and we need each other. We need everybody's um, traditional ecological knowledge. We need people's wisdom. We need people's uh, skills to protect not only loons, but all sorts of natural resources. And in the Arctic, when things are changing so quickly, I think this story, you know, it's about yellow-billed loons and some other loons, but it's really relevant for a lot of species. So, okay, Gay, next slide, please. So a little bit of a background about the yellow-billed loon. Um, they are, um, this is a comparative slide to show you about, um, how they rank among other loon species. So there are three uh, other loon species, all five loon species in the world occur in your area and um, on the Seward Peninsula, which is pretty special. And of those three are um, considered to be climate vulnerable. And yellow builds are the most. They're um, considered near threatened on some lists. They were considered twice for listing under the Endangered Species Act in the past, but there was not enough data about them to pursue that listing. The red-throated loon, although it's not globally threatened, there are challenges with its um, populations in Alaska. They are in decline and there's not a lot of research going on about them. So we're trying to fill some gaps there as well. And Pacific loons, um, they're uh, doing well as, as well, but um, some of their life history traits are similar to yellow-billed loons traits. So they think they will be vulnerable to climate change as well. Next slide, please. The yellow-billed loon is a beautiful bird, as you can see. It's the largest of our five species of loon that looks very similar to common loons in its body markings, but it's got its signature stunning ivory bill that distinguishes it. Um, all loons are piscivores. Some are um, more than others, but yellow-billed loons as adults are obligate piscivores, which means they really only feed on fish. Um, they, there are some studies that show that they've eaten some other crustaceans and things, but fish is the main diet. Um, the, the youngsters sometimes get fed little crabs and snails and things. Um, and they utilize both marine and freshwater habitats. Next slide, please. There are about 32,000 yellow-billed loons estimated to be in the world. And if you think about that number, it sounds sort of large, but if we compare it to, you know, the population of the city of Fairbanks, Alaska, and we think, wow, if all the people in Fairbanks, Alaska, which are the city proper, which is about 30, 35,000 people, and those were the only people on the planet, um, you can see that that makes it a particularly rare bird. Of those, we have about 4,500 of those birds nesting in Alaska, and Alaska is the only place in the United States where the birds are nesting. And in the Seward Peninsula area, there are about 1,500. The circum they they um, occur in a circumpolar distribution about the globe, and most of them are in remote locations. So that has made it hard to study them and know about them. There are a lot of data gaps about the species. And what's really neat is that they return to the same nesting sites each year. They have really a, a huge commitment to co going back to the same exact nest sites or nesting lakes, and there's competition for those good lakes. Um, they're an international species of concern, and we're going to talk about that a little more. Next slide, please. So some of the concerns and threats that are facing yellow-billed loons are this small global population size. There's very little data about birds when they're off of the breeding ground. So we've been doing research in Alaska and the North Slope where they have a population and also in Western Alaska where they breed. But when they're in the ocean and they're migrating or they're non-breeding birds that are young and they're out there or they're on their wintering grounds, we don't have a lot of data about them. And on the nesting grounds, it seems like because they're so particular about these 
certain lakes that they want to nest at and they come back to those certain lakes every year, there's limited spaces for nesting habitat that are preferred for yellow-billed loons. So that limits how many birds at a time can be breeding successfully. Because they're a large bird and they have a long lifespan, they have a very low reproductive rate and often they only lay one to two eggs and usually only one of those eggs they are able to um, nurture to um, a little nestling that can survive. Environmental contaminants affect them not only um, on, in the marine environment but also on the breeding grounds. They face environmental contaminant challenges when they go um, some of the birds from the Seward Peninsula have been radio tagged or GPS tagged internally with um, tags that go inside their bodies and the data has shown that they go some of them go all the way to the Yellow Sea and that is very highly contaminated with effluent from manufacturing and industry and um, in in these pristine environments in the north we get um, uh, contaminants that get caught in the jet stream and get carried over into Arctic regions and deposited in these pristine areas. And so um, they can be impacted by envir environmental contaminants in both places. Recent studies have shown that they have low genetic diversity in Alaska and Canada, and we're gonna talk about that some more. But that puts um, a species at a disadvantage for adapting to change. They are sensitive um, to disturbance, particularly if things are on the ground and they may abandon their nests. So a lot of their habitat is sort of intersecting or getting close to development in certain areas of the state. And so that can cause some challenges with productivity. There have been some documentation of um, birds getting net, uh, entangled in fishing nets. Um, we don't have a lot of data about that. There is some information that a lot of folks, when they see that, try to get them untangled, and that's great. With increased vessel traffic, with um, sea ice retreating in the Bering Sea, there's concern for disturbance when the birds are on, on the water in the ocean, and also with potential for increased marine incidents like oil spills. A lot of the concerns in this department that we're worried about with other seabirds are also applicable to yellow-billed loons. And we're getting more development near their particular breeding habitats. They're breeding in the NPRA and National Petroleum Reserve Alaska. Um, and there could be some other developments happening in and around the Seward Peninsula that may um, cause some disturbance. And then our challenges with climate warming impacts and their lake habitats and um, changes in marine habitats and trophic levels could impact them as well. Next slide, please. So this is the breeding range of the yellow-billed loon. This was developed by the, um, a group of concerned um, ent agencies and entities that came together to pull, um, to develop a, a conservation agreement for yellow-billed loons in Alaska to come up with strategies to address these concerns. And so you can see most of their habitat is up um, in the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska on the Arctic Coastal Plain and then some in the state land. And the NPRA, National Petroleum Reserve, is in that sort of peachy color. And then the state land is pink. And if over on the west are the two populations that we look at, we consider them one population, but there's the birds that are kind of on Cape Krusenstern and in Cape Krusenstern National Monument and in Bering Lambridge on the Northern Seward Peninsula. Next slide, please. So I work for the Arctic Inventory and Monitoring Network, or ARCAN. We like our acronyms. And it is a grouping of five national park lands across the Arctic, including Cape Krusenstern National Monument and Bering Lambridge National Preserve, Caker and Bella. And this is where we conduct our loon surveys based on the conserv conservation agreement map. Next slide, please. The conservation agreement uh, it was really important in establishing a lot of the direction for when we were developing our long-term monitoring program for yellow-billed loons. And it's, I really appreciate this document. It develops strategies and data gaps. It identifies these issues. 
all for the goal of trying to protect yellow-billed loons breeding in habitat, brood rearing and migration habitats in Alaska, and pretend, uh, sort of prevent further um, damage or endangerment of the species. And it's really neat because a lot of people came together to work on this document. It included Alaska Department of Fish and Game, Alaska Department of Natural Resources, the North Slope Borough, and different um, entities under the Department of Interior. Next slide, please. So the, the document lined out strategies for uh, both populations in Alaska, North Slope and Western Alaska. And I just selected the ones here for Western Alaska that are relevant for the Bering Straits region. And so strategy two was for population inventory and monitoring needs. And at that time when they were developing this program, we weren't really regularly doing inventories and monitoring the Western Alaskan population. And then the strategy four is about biological research. And what I wanna point out here is that monitoring and research are a little bit different. Monitoring follows a strict protocol, as, as does research, and it's going um, back and being consistent and collecting data, um, often annually or over a prescribed period of time to um, track status and trends of certain questions. Often, though, it doesn't provide the context that we need to answer why those trends are shifting, why they're going up or why they're going down. And that's where we need to have um, data gaps addressed with research and focused questions that often test a question and provide some answers to why we're seeing what we're seeing in the monitoring. Next slide, please. Are you on the yellow build moon vital sign arc and long-term monitoring slide? I'm sorry, I'm on slide 10 if that helps. One more. Um, there you go, there yellow you go. bills, there you go. Thank yeah, you. Sorry for that. So when we're monitoring our yellow billed loons, um, we have a strict protocol and we did a scoping meeting back in 2004 or five to determine what kinds of things we would need to monitor in order to assess the health of parklands. And so we had lots of different experts and people who had a lot of knowledge about different kinds of components in the natural and physical world in the parks. And we wanted to make sure we were selecting things that were representative of each region. And so the yellow-billed loon got selected because it does live in both marine and freshwater ecosystems. And so it can provide maybe insight into movement of marine derived, derived nutrients into freshwater systems. And as a top trophic level predator with that piscivore, you know, uh, fish eating drive in lake ecosystems, it's, uh, it provides a lot of insight as a um, sentinel species if something goes awry. Because they're large and they're distinctive with that um, beautiful bill, they're easy to spot from the air, so they're something that can be surveyed. It's really challenging, for example, to do aerial surveys on something like shorebirds because they're in flocks and they're little and there's so many of them. And, um, but for something like waterfowl, especially the yellow billed loon is a large bird, it's easy to, to use it as a, um, a metric. And because they return to the same breeding sites each year, we can get really good trend data. So that's very helpful. And as long-lived birds, we can also look at other um, mechanisms that they could provide information, like being bioindicators for um, contaminants. We didn't include that as an official monitoring objective because it's very expensive and we were concerned about the long-term um, ability to get consistent funding for contaminants analysis. So what we've been doing is um, uh, uh, targeted research to get funding for that, to do that when we need to revisit that. So our objectives for our loon monitoring program are to um, assess habitat occupancy and use of yellow-billed loons on the landscape in both Bella and Caker, and to assess the density of the population there and the distribution, where they're occurring, what lakes are they using. And we're getting some value-added information because all five species occur there. So we're collecting data on all the loons that we see. 
even though this is, uh, study is designed to target habitat that yellow-billed loons prefer. Next slide, please. So the Western Alaskan habitat, as you guys know, since you live there, is a beautiful assortment of high latitude wetlands in the tundra. The birds are attracted to these deep, clear, fish bearing lakes um, and ponds that have stable water levels. If the water levels fluctuate, they can um, wash out the nest or flood the nest. And so they really seek these lakes that have all of these components. And it's a big ask, you know, it's a beautiful lake. Everyone wants a lake that has lots of fish and is clear and clean. And so they have to be very um, protective of this habitat because it's pretty limited. So this limited, uh, limits the availability of nesting habitat for the species. Next slide, please. So how we conduct these surveys, um, Based on a lot of great research uh, done by USGS, US Fish and Wildlife Service and Park Service in the um, early 2000s and mid 2000s. Um, they they um, got a lot of good in baseline information from the work done on the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska on the populations there. And so we had some information from historic waterfowl surveys. They did transect surveys that were straight line flights and got some information on where loons were occurring there. And then they also um, realized that they were missing information on nesting. So they came up with these lake circling, this lake circling technique specifically for yellow-billed loons to try to find their nests. So it's focused on these large lakes that are seven hectares in size or greater. And that size was determined from their research, previous research on the North Slope. So they weren't finding yellow-billed loons on lakes smaller than seven hectares. They really want those larger lakes. And um, what, we're, what we did was, or what Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS did was look for all of the lakes that met, met those components, the large size, and then they um, removed all of the habitat, other habitat, and created um, a map or plots of all of um, the possible yellow balloon habitat in Cape Cruz and Stern and Bering Lambridge. And then we selected a random pool from those. So we do 24 of those plots. Six of them are in Cape Cruz and Stern, 18 of them are in Bering Lambridge. And we're gonna do them in perpetuity. So the funding for the monitoring program comes from a separate pot of money than like regular park service funding does. So monitoring program is separate and hopefully protected for a while at least um, so that the long-term component can continue. And so we'll be doing the exact same plots over time. We do these every other year and that was a compromise for cost because aerial surveys are expensive. So we do biennial surveys. Um, but because the birds are so faithful, such high nest site fidelity to go back to the same sites every year, um, we feel like we can accommodate that. Like I said, we're collecting value added information on all the loon species that we see, even though the loon, this program is set up specifically for yellow-billed loons. But if we see other species, they do overlap in their ranges or the habitats that they use, we do collect it. And we also collect information on eiders and on, on swans as well, because they're pretty easy to see. And then we also do this with two aircraft because we need to repeat the sampling to improve detection probability. And a simple way to explain detection probability is if I, if I sent only one aircraft out there, um, and the yellow-billed loon decided to hop over to another lake or dive for a fish. When the first plane came by, they would miss it. And so I might say that that lake didn't have a loon on it when it did. But if I have two planes, I improve my chances of catching a bird on that lake. Or I might not miss the nest. Someone might turn around and look or be a better observer and see where a nest is tucked in under a bush. And so that's why it's really important to do the repeat sampling to get really good um, numbers for your habitat use and your occupancy data. 
Um, next slide, please. So just a quick look at the, the five species. The co common loon isn't shown here because <laughs> ironically, it's uncommon in your area. So we do get it and they do nest. We actually have seen more nests um, in Cape Cruz and Stern around Sisolik than um, in uh, Bering Lambridge, but they do nest in both places. And so we've got um, red-throated loons on the bottom left and Arctic loons in the middle on the bottom and Pacific loons on the bottom and the right. So it's pretty special that all five species occur in your area. Next slide, please. So when we conduct these aerial lake circling surveys, um, we're using two aircraft and we're optimizing the detection of loons and nests. We do this in late June because we wanna make sure ice off has happened and the loons have initiated their nests, but they have not yet um, had babies that hatched because once the babies hatch, then they leave the nest and everybody's on the water and um, it's hard to count them and find them. We repeat the surveys. The two aircraft that are flying the surveys have to repeat it between four and 48 hours. We don't wanna to do too soon because we don't wanna um, flush the birds right after they've had a plane go over them. And we don't want it to be um, too long for analytical reasons. Next slide, please. So the, the name of the game for the way we do our work is we fly low and slow and we're looking out the same window. So we use tandem aircraft where the observer sits right behind the pilot. And that's way, that way we can both look out the same window and use two pairs of eyes to look for birds. It's really important to um, have experienced crew. And I think anyone that's done aerial survey work understands that uh, for any kind of species. Um, the loons can look similar to one another and it isn't impossible. It's, it's, people get it after over time, but it's really important to have a search image and when you're turning, when we fly these lakes, we're, we're basically flying the perimeter of each lake um, a couple of times, and then we go over the middle in long passes. And uh, you can get kind of dizzy, <laughs> and you can lose, you can get disoriented. And so it really takes um, some practice to be able to keep your composure and also look down um, and collect your data without losing track of the animals. Next slide, please. So here's a picture of our experienced crew. I don't know if some of you recognize Marcy Johnson there on the end. She helped us a few times. And we work with um, Golden Eagle sometimes as well. Those guys are great. So um, down at the bottom is our iPad. It's really neat that we had uh, a fella in our I, um, GPS shop developed a program called Park Observer that's slick. You use it on the iPads and it collects um, survey data. It has a built-in data sheet, sheet, sheet and a moving map function so that you can keep track of where you are. So when you're spinning around all day and you, you finish one lake and you go to the next one and you're spinning and you go to the next one and you're spinning, you can really make sure that you know where you're at and you can mark accurate loon locations. Next slide, please. So along the lines with our um, strategies that came from the conservation agreement, we wanted to make sure that we were do, uh, analyzing our data for our monitoring work to see that it was really answering the metric questions that we had. And we did this work collaboratively with um, Josh Schmidt, who's a biometrician for the Central Alaska Network, but he also helps with ARCAN, and Fish and Wildlife Service and Ducks Unlimited. Next slide, please. So our goal wasn't only to develop field methods to be able to reliably figure out the parameters that we wanted to look at, habitat use, occupancy, distribution of these birds, but we also wanted to make sure we had an analytical metric, a way to analyze the data that would work. 
and it's really challenging to do this because we're looking at um, remote landscapes with that are large. We have a rare species, so that makes it challenging because you may not get enough detections. Then we have another species that we're looking at, Pacific loons, and they occur overlapping the yellow-billed loon habitat, but both species are kind of in clumpy patches dispersed across the whole landscape, the whole study area. So that's really challenging analytically to try to build something that's going to be robust to that. In addition, doing aerial surveys is expensive, so you want to make sure that your metric that you're using and the data that you're analyzing um, is worth the cost, right? If you're collecting this data and spending this money on flying these surveys and then you can't, you can't answer your questions, that's, that's not a good thing. Um, next slide, please. So what we were trying to do in this study, we had two years of data. We had 2011 and 2013. Recall that we do our surveys every other year biennially to save money. And so we wanted to look at the population size of yellow-billed loons and Pacific loons, their distribution across Bella and Caker, and how they were using the habitat. And so these really talented biometricians, Josh Schmidt and um, Johan Walker, came up with this dynamic multi-state occupancy model. And what that means, it's a lot of words, but it means we're looking at how the lakes, the lake is the unit of study, and we're looking at how the lakes are used by the birds. So we're looking at two years and two species, and we're trying to see how those two um, uh, parameters, the years and the species, differ over time. So we have three states in which the birds can use the lakes. They cannot use the lakes unused. Nobody wants to go there. They can use the lakes or be on them, like in this picture, or they can be using specifically for nesting. So those are our three states. Use, no use, use for nesting. And we want to see if a lake that's used for nesting by Pacific loons in 2011, is it used again for nesting by Pacific loons in 2013? And we want to do that for yellow-billed loons as well and see, um, in addition, if we can determine if yellow-billed loons are excluding or driving away Pacific loons from habitat because there was data that showed they were doing that very thing on the North Slope. So there's a competition component. Next slide, please. One of the other things we wanted to do is look at distribution. And so this map shows the distribution of Pacific loons and yellow-billed loons in 2011 and 2013. Pacific loons are shown in the grayish hues and yellow-billed loons are shown in the golden hues. And 2011 is gray and 2013 is blue for Pacifics. And 2011 is yellow and orange is 2013 for yellow buildings. So you can kind of get an idea when you look sort of on the other side of um, Shushmaref there, that some of that um, habitat and the habitat uh, far off to the east um, by Espenberg is really um, ideal habitat for the loons. It seems to be that we're getting larger um, numbers of detections in those areas and not so many up in Cruz and Cern, but um, we had a couple of years where we weren't able to get up there. We had some weather that pro prohibited us getting up there. It's the same for um, out by Wales. We had a harder time getting out there for weather. So next slide, please. So I won't go into all the metric stuff because I wanna make sure we have time to talk about other things. But what I wanna say is that um, some of the results were really cool. Basically, what we found was that there was low turnover in the states. So basically, if a lake was unused, it kind of remained unused. And those numbers stayed pretty consistent between 2011 and 2013 across both species. We found that about 67% um, of all the lakes, so we had 1,291 lakes in our area, 67% were used by Pacific loons. And that includes both used and used for nesting. And 33% were used by yellow-billed loons. Now that number is lower for yellow-billed likely because they're picking those particular large lakes, right? So they're limited by the habitat that's out there. Almost no lakes were shared between species for nesting. We had one incident incidence on a really large lake where we had a yellow-billed loon nesting with a Pacific loon. In all other instances um, across years, those two years, 
yellow-billed loons nested on the large lakes and Pacifics were excluded onto smaller lakes. So that was similar to what they found on the North Slope in Haynes's paper in 2014. So what this implies is that um, the, good, the habitat is likely saturated, like good lakes are good lakes and the birds are going back to those. And um, possibly these populations are stable, the breeding component of these populations. Next slide, please. So that kind of ticked off our box for, you know, affecting, effect, evaluating the effectiveness of our monitoring surveys, which is really cool. And we had an opportunity to do this again with um, Bureau of Land Management and work with them on their um, population and National Petroleum Reserve. So next slide, please. So our long-term monitoring study that I just talked about has been going some, from 2011 to 2018. Um, we got some extra funds and another biometrician in our office named Jeremy Mizell wanted to start um, a red-throated loon survey that ran concurrently in time and space um, over the yellow bill loon surveys from 2016 to 2018. And then Bureau of Land Management had some money too and were doing some other work that included the loons. They were doing some fish work and they needed to do the loon stuff. So they said, let's jump in on this too. So they copied our survey methods, except they used a, a helicopter because their, um, they had a helicopter pad in their area. They work out of Inagok and they were um, 30 kilometers in. So helicopter, it was a, a better choice for them. When we do our surveys, we needed to use aircraft because we based out of Kotzebue and we had to come over the the, the water, and so we use float planes as much as possible. And so this is really exciting because this is an opportunity for us to compare um, what's happening in the two populations. What's also really satisfying for me was that our random draw of plots was missing sort of a big chunk of the central northern Seward Peninsula. And so Jeremy's data with the Red Throat and Loon surveys was filling that in. One, say, one thing I want to say is that the red-throated loons are smaller birds, they're more coastal, and they occur in very small water bodies. And so you can see on this picture, there's the big black squares, which are the ones for yellow-billed loons, and then there are little white squares, and those are the smaller squares that are targeting particular small wetland habitat for the red-throated loons. Next slide, please. This is just a close-up of Jeremy's, oh, sorry, next slide. My apologies. Um, yes, trying to get, there we go. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Gay. So um, this is just a close-up of uh, both the yellow-billed loon and the red-throated loon surveys so you can get a better picture of it. And you can see we had 31 little plots and they were um, six by six, I believe, maybe, maybe five by five. And some of them overlap our yellow-billed loon surveys. Um, what Jeremy wanted to do was he actually double sampled or triple sampled some of his plots um, to try to get some really good information since he wasn't doing long-term monitoring. He wanted to make sure he was getting really good detection probabilities. Um, and so what's nice is that we got additional data in some of our yellow-billed loon plots as well because they got overlapped by the red-throated loon survey plots. Next slide, please. So these are some of the results. And this is what you could do when you have a lot of data, and it's pretty neat. Um, so Jeremy made an aggregated breeding occupancy probability map for each species and then one for all three species. And so this is the one for Pacific loons, and it's a heat map. So basically, the warmer colors are higher density. The blue is where his cutoff was for habitat. So Pacific loons can nest on a wider range of um, lake sizes. And so he cut it off at um, one hectare or greater. And so anything in blue didn't have any detections because it wasn't included in the analysis. So the light green is where you have lowest density of Pacific loons, and the red is where you have the 
highest density. And this is combined data between the yellow moon survey monitoring data and his red-throated moon survey data. So this is really neat and gives us a good, good, great information about important birding areas for Pacific loons and also just distribution across the landscape. Next slide, please. So this is the map for yellow-billed loons, and it looks different because we um, uh, restricted it at seven hectares lake size or greater. And so you can see there's fewer of those lakes. Um, what's really exciting about this is um, that it, it's, I just really appreciate that it combines the data from both surveys and gives us a really good picture of what yellow-billed loons are doing in Bering Land Bridge. It's so informative. Next slide, please. And then here's the one for red-throated loons. So these are the little coastal species. They don't get very far inland and they're almost on puddles. So he restricted the size here to um, 0.2 hectares or greater. And you can see that they're pretty coastal. Next slide, please. But this is the um, combined map for red-throated loons, yellow loons, and Pacific loons. And so I think this is really neat because it really identifies important loon habitat across the landscape. And so I'm excited and I'm planning to approach Audubon, Alaska about setting um, aside some of these areas and identifying them as important burning areas for loons, for these three species of loons. Okay, next slide. So back to our conservation strategies. So we've done our monitoring. I think we're doing pretty good there. Um, and now we've got a biological research component. And the reason that we do research is to fill in gaps and to provide context for monitoring to understand why these things are happening. But to decide what gaps to address, you know, that can be challenging. So we go back to um, our concerns and threats and our conservation agreement to see what was recommended. And then we look around and see what our current challenges are. Next slide, please. So a lot of things on this list we can't really do much about. Um, the things that we can address are trying to learn more about the preferred nesting habitat. We can address trying to understand and measure baseline levels of environmental contaminants. We can assess genetic diversity. We have samples to do that. And we can um, assess climate warming impacts on lake habitats, permafrost melt and lake draining. So those are four things that we've pursued to try to learn about. And what's neat is that this work has also been done on the North Slope so that the two populations are doing similar kinds of work. We're trying to use the same researchers across both areas so that the data are consistent, so that we'll have information across all of the populations of yellow-billed loons in Alaska, and we'll have additional information on red-throated loons and Pacific loons too. Next slide, please. So I think this slide, oh, it did work. I was worried it didn't come through. So this is collaborative research. So this is soft money funded work we've pursued to um, grants to get it funded. And it's a variety of um, approaches to answer different questions. So the synthetic aperture radar or SAR imagery work on the far left, along with the ice growth models, we worked with USGS and UAF, Ben Jones and Chris Arp. And basically we were trying to get a handle on where freshwater fish were overwintering. The SAR imagery can detect um, areas of open water in winter, and those are likely places that harbor fish and are thus important to loons because loons eat fish. And the ice growth models help them understand in different, um, over different years, how um, the ice might melt or grow and how those fish might be distributed. So that's a first step in trying to understand um, why certain lakes are important to yellow-billed loons and why, you know, sort of building a, components for a habitat selection model for loons in the future. In the middle, there's environmental DNA or eDNA. And this is kind of a way to um, assess presence or absence of a species 
from an environmental sample. So you could use soil. In our case, we used um, water, uh, water from a lake, and, and then we can bring it back to the lab. We, use, we work with USGS and the Environmental Contaminants Lab, Sandy Talbot and da Damian Menning down there, and with Trey Simmons as well, because he's a, the Central Alaska Network um, Streams Ecologist, to try to see if we can detect, if we can find if, um, without having to use aircraft, use other tools to see if we have um, presence or absence of loons or particular fish in the lake. So we want to find out what kind of fish are in the lakes that we know loons are nesting on. So we've been collecting fish um, environmental samples there in DNA and um, they've been teasing it out in the lab to try to figure out which species occur in loon lakes, what they might be eating. And we also wanted to see if it could be a proxy for um, survey work or if there was a question about a lake being used by a loon, we could use it to um, substantiate or negate other data. We also are um, looking at environmental contaminants and genetics, and I'll talk more about those in, more in depth on the next slide. So Sandy Talbot and her team uh, did an analysis of genetic diversity of yellow-billed loons, specific loons and red-throated loons in Alaska, based on samples from the North Slope and from the Seward Peninsula that we provided to them. So that we could see if, we were wondering if the two populations were um, the same or if they were distinct. And we wondered that because uh, even though um, the, the birds on the North Slope are really restricted to large lakes, it seems like our birds on the Seward Peninsula are nesting on smaller lakes, which was a surprise. When we were developing our study design, um, we missed that. We were <laughs> finding birds on these smaller lakes. And then um, with the tagging data, we realized that they were um, actually going out to the Oren o ocean a lot to forage because they are on the peninsula and they're not 30 kilometers inland. Loons are heavy birds. They are built for diving. They pursue fish. Most birds have hollow bones, but loons have solid bones, and their legs are far back on their body to propel them underwater. And so trying to fly long distances, like 30 kilometers to go to the ocean to forage, is not energetically feasible for them. But apparently it is on the Seward Peninsula, so they're doing some behavioral things that are different. And we had questions about maybe they're really distinct. So we wanted to look at that. Next slide, please. So of the five species of loons that nest in the high latitude ecosystems of North America, three of them, including the three that we've talked about today, Pacific, red-throated, and yellow-billed, are considered as highly vulnerable to climate change. And it's based on these particular traits in the next slide, please. So there's a component called sensitivity and that is the potential for a species to persist in, in place, um, in, on location. Are they able to, you know, maintain where they're at? Can they do it? Exposure is the extent to which species physical environment will change. And then the adaptive capacity is their ability to um, ad adjust, negate these impacts of climate change through either changing their behaviors, dispersing, or actually microevolutionary change, which isn't so great for long-lived species that don't produce lots of offspring. If you're like a mouse or a krill, you might have higher adaptive capacity, but as a loon, <laughs> not so much. So these three um, are kind of in trouble. Common and Arctic, uh, we just don't have enough data to include them in that list. Likely they'd be there too. Next slide, please. I'm not going to go into a lot of this. Um, I just wanted to make a note to let you know the different genetic markers that they used. They're markers that are inherited from mom and dad together from the nuclear genome or the nucleus of the cell. And then there are some that are inherited from the mitochondrial DNA. That's a circular chromosome, usually passed down maternally. And these two have higher and faster mutation rates, so you can answer different kinds of questions with them. 
about relatedness and things. Microsatellite data is usually used for like identifying people and genetic fingerprinting as well as like paternity testing, if that helps you. So it's close relationships. Mitochondrial DNA is more phylogenetic relationship type history. Um, and then nuclear introns, which are also both related, you know, uh, inherited from mom and dad, but they have a slower mutation rate. So in combination, they use those three markers to get a suite of um, uh, metrics that define variation in a population. And usually variation is good <laughs> if you're trying to adapt and little variation is not so good. So next slide. This is just the sampling locales where we were able to get samples from. So Seward Peninsula, there's four, or four spots um, in the NPRA that they sampled. And then there's two populations in um, Canada that they also included. Next slide, please. So what they found was that, yes, yellow-billed loon, um, let me explain here, uh, N is the number of samples, and um, K is the metric. And so I'm, I won't go into what those mean, but I just want to show you that yellow-billed loons were the lowest. <laughs> um, yes, uh, red-throated loons are also down there too. And so um, yellow-billeds were, um, they have very little genetic variation compared to the other species of loons. And loons in general don't have a lot of variation compared to other um, water birds. Next slide, please. They did another kind of analysis on the genetic data um, to cluster the different um, genotypes, basically. And um, what they found was that Seward Peninsula is very distinct from both, um, and that's in blue, from Northern, um, sorry, NPRA, National Petroleum Reserve Alaska birds, and from the Can Can Canada birds, Canadian birds. So the Seward Pen was um, even more distinct than Alaska and uh, NPRA and Canada birds were from each other. So that's pretty interesting. So work in that continues. So it appears that the North Slope birds and the Seward Peninsula birds are indeed different. Next slide. And then we did work with environmental contaminants and mostly um, Work has been focused on mercury. And um, basically, this allows us to sort of assess the health of the, not only the loon, but of the aquatic system of the lake. Um, what's interesting is that you think that the, the egg would be a local signature, but actually the birds gain weight um, on, on the migration route in the ocean. And then when they come back, to the breeding grounds, they deposit all of the fat reserves into the eggs. So the eggs are actually a signature of the off breeding ground contaminants exposure when the birds were um, overwintering or migrating. And then um, to get a signature of the, at the breeding ground, we use um, prey fish from the lake. And um, this work is conducted by Dr. Angela Matz, who's the chief of the Ecological Contaminants Program at Fish and Wildlife Service, and with Debbie Nigro, who is the primary investigator at Bureau of Land Management for the Yellow Bill Moon Project there. In addition to mercury, other metals are analyzed, including, uh, and also persistent organic pollutants, organochlorine pesticides, pluro, perfluorinated hydrocarbons, polychlorinated biphenyl conagers, and polybrominated brominated diphenyls. A lot of these materials are things that um, are in um, fire retardants and are um, byproducts of plastics. So um, for now, those, um, that long list of chemicals, those are in, not in um, the red zone for these species. But for yellow-billed loons, um, in Seward Peninsula and on the North Slope, mercury is approaching um, levels that could impede reproduction. So mercury 
tends to accumulate in hair and keratin and also in embryos. And so it can impede reproduction because it can sicken the embryos. The adult birds can seem to tolerate higher levels. Um, this may not be, uh, it's hard to know where the source is of the mercury. Alaska has a lot of natural background mercury. And um, so sometimes it's hard to tease out if this is um, something that's coming from Arctic haze or if it's natural sources. But what's neat about this project, next slide please, is that we've been able to bring interns into the lab and not only um, learn to process the samples, but um, next slide please. Also go out, get the aviation training and learn to collect them too. And this is great because it's engaging youth in real resource management questions and challenges. And it's really exciting to watch them really grasp it and, and get engaged. They become very passionate. Next slide, please. Sometimes we get surprises and we get catastrophic lake draining events um, that we didn't anticipate. <laughs> And some of our survey lakes have drained in 2018 and 2019. Um, and so we have to respond to this. So this is research as well that is addressing an emerging need. And um, for this event, we turned to our physical scientist, Dave Swanson, who measures permafrost melt in Bering Lambridge, and our aquatic ecologist for shallow lakes, Amy Larson. And so um, Dave published a paper about this event and actually in 2019 about three square miles of water was drained from Bering Lambridge so the drainage is accelerating. The landscape of lakes in this area has a natural process of lakes um, draining and forming but in 2018 and 2019 the drainage exceeded the formation. And so next slide please. I took a picture of a lake that drained in 2018 and 2009 when I started the surveys. And what's stunning about this is how quickly they drain. Um, usually a lake drainage that's a natural event is slower. And um, but you can see here on, on the right, it's a whole mud flat. Like it just went, sometimes these things can go overnight. That's happened in Yukon Charlie and in other places in the state that Amy's been working. But um, yeah, so this was kind of alarming for this many large lakes to go. So when we have th something like this, you know, we turn to research, but we also have to get the word out through science communication. Next slide, please. And so we have um, video storytelling workshops where we try to get interns and young professionals engaged in telling these um, emerging conservation stories. and. It's really great to develop their skill sets. It's a good resume building skill, but it's also really great to hear their voices and to let them have, you know, really ownership of crafting a story that's relevant and fresh and resonates with other youth. And so um, I have one more slide, but then if we have time, we have a great video to share with um, you. It's one of our interns produced at Delaney Vinson. She's really talented and has been doing science communication videos with us for a while. Her video is entitled Loon Without, Loons Without Lakes and it captures this story, this emerging story of the draining lakes in western Alaska. So last slide here. Here's our student from Shishmaref. This is a talk to, Sam talk to. You guys might know him. And this is Sam Burnett's little guy on the left. And we just wanted to say it does really take a village and Thank you for listening. All right. Well, thank you, Melanie. Um, now, do you want to show the film? Yeah, if we have time. All right. Uh, how about the audience? You guys want to see her film? It's it's not very long, and I, I think it's probably um, wonderful. Six minutes. Uh, yes. Okay. All right. Now, bear with me because, uh, Melanie, are you gonna are you gonna try to show it on your phone i don't think i can yep. i don't know how to share my screen with you guys okay well if you uh, i can answer that question and all you do is you go down to the bottom bar and it says um uh share there should be like a yeah it, i don't have it for some reason 
Okay, well, we'll, we'll try this out. So bear with me, I'm gonna stop share for a minute. It's gonna get, um, so let's see, what have I got? All right, I'm gonna pull that up. And then get back to you all somehow. And there's the movie. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Do you want to have a little intro or anything? Delaney um, is a geosci geoscientist and park intern. And she's really um, developed her science communication skills. She made this using Final Cut Pro. And um, we worked together on the script. Um, she also got to work with other um, science uh, experts in their field. You know, she talked to Dave Swanson and Amy Larson and other people to get information. So um, she took a lot of ownership in this and she did a beautiful job. So. All right, well, let's hope if, if, if there's a technical problem, somebody say something and I'll hear you. I better get the video, my video off. Stop that. Okay, here we go. In April, rafts of yellow balloons float in the Yellow Sea of China, feasting on fish, fuel for their migration to their breeding grounds in Alaska. The yellow balloon is considered one of the 10 rarest breeding birds of the mainland U.S. The species is of international concern, with the total global population estimated at only 21,000 birds. Approximately 5,000 yellow balloons depend on access to the large freshwater lakes in Alaska's Arctic for nesting, foraging, and chick rearing every summer. Unfortunately, coastal national parks in Arctic Alaska are losing lakes rapidly, a change accelerated by warming temperatures. Here in Bering Land Bridge, lakes have been forming and draining and drying for thousands of years. And we can see old uh, lake basins scattered throughout the entire park. And so what we're trying to understand is is this happening at a more rapid rate than it used to happen historically? In 2018 and 19, Several large lakes used by yellow balloons drained rapidly in Alaska's Bering Land Bridge National Preserve. Lake surface area dropped abruptly, and three square miles of water drained in just a single summer. Left behind were barren mud flats to avoid balloons, fish, invertebrates, and vegetation. Much of the Arctic sits on top of a layer of continuously frozen soil called permafrost. As the ground warms, ice in the permafrost melts and lake shores subside or sink. In areas where there is more ice in the permafrost and in years with heavy snowfall, high water levels in the spring can create overflow and new pathways for water to run out of the lake. The newly formed channels cause all the water to drain and result in the disappearance of lakes and loss of habitat. Ideal lake habitats are limited. Loons are highly philopatric, meaning they return to the same nesting lakes every year. If their lakes drain, they have to search for new nesting sites. But because of intense competition among loons, most nesting habitat is already occupied. More than a decade of loon population survey data, combined with satellite imagery and Bering Land Bridge, indicate remarkable lake changes are underway. If lake loss continues, this will have large impacts on the yellow bow balloon's ability to survive and reproduce. Lake loss in the Arctic is sadly not the only threat facing loons. There's likely going to be 
more impacts from humans just with an Arctic that's opening, more ship traffic, more oil and gas development. The loss of sea ice is opening up the Arctic in, in a way that's not really been open before. When you have more ships that are coming through an area, by the very nature of the fact that there are more ships, you're increasing the likelihood that there could be a shipping incident. What we know from oil spills is that once it goes into a, an area of marshland or an estuary, it really is there to stay. Think about that in the Arctic, an environment that changes much more slowly. We're going to have that oil leaching into the fish resources and everything else that is culturally important in that area. So that's the one thing that we really have to strive not to let happen. And yellow balloons are top predators in the ecosystem. They are um, obligate piscivores, which means they, as adults, have to eat fish to survive. Anything that becomes a uh, contaminant that may fall into freshwater bodies on nesting lakes, um, that may then affect the fish, can get into and bioaccumulate in the birds themselves. Novel shifts in the marine food web of the Arctic could also have impacts on food survival. There would be some species that are going to be moving into the lagoons that we've never seen before, just with species moving northward. In the lagoons we studied last summer, I think we found over 30 species that were new to a particular lagoon. Small population size coupled with low genetic diversity leave the loons less equipped to adapt to rapid changes within their ecosystem. Will the yellow-billed loons be able to cope with these widespread challenges? Thank you. That was great. Um, thanks, Melanie. So thank you very much. And um, and let's open it up for um, for questions. Let's open it up for questions. I know I've got some questions. Does anyone have questions for Melanie about the yellow billed loon? There was a question from Lou Tobin in the chat box. Oh well, yeah. If you do Zoom, let me tell you, if you're looking at the chat box and you're the one sharing the screen, you cannot advance, you cannot advance the slides. So I, was, I saw that, but I couldn't, I had to get rid of chat. So Lou Tobin had a question, uh, Melanie, about the chicks. And so um, it says, if the population of the lakes doesn't change over time, does that mean that none of the chicks from the nesting pairs or very few of them return to the lakes they were raised in? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, they uh, the parents will defend their nesting lake, and so there's a lot of youngsters that are out on the ocean. They'll they'll come into the freshwater areas as well, and they'll always be prospecting and looking for a spot. Loons have um, delayed maturity for sexual reproduction, so often they don't aren't able to reproduce until they're four or five, six, seven years old. So they've got a gap there, but they're always prospecting and looking for a spot to move in um, to take a space away. But 
Um, so they'll all come back to bearing lamb bridge. At least that's what the genetic data sort of indicates. Um, they hang out on the ocean, kind of off the coast there, and um, go back and forth, but they aren't on the, the nesting lakes. They don't, they don't get to take over a nesting lake unless they outcompete a parent that ages. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Lou, does that get it for you there? Does that give you an answer? If you're trying to talk, Lou, you got to unmute, which is on the bottom. There's a little microphone and you just click on that and it should go green on you, I think. Okay. Okay. Oh, it says one new message. Let's see what that says. Yes. Okay. Got you, Lou. We got you. So yes, that answers. Thank you. I, I actually had a question on the, on the, um, on the diversity. So it looked like the Seward Peninsula was very different genetically than um, further north. And um, I wondered about, because I'm, I'm in Nome, um, and it's actually, this is actually a great thing that you can, you can come in. We would nor not normally have seen you come through Nome because you're in Kotzebue. So this is actually a COVID silver lining that we get you tonight. But my <laughs> question would be, if the Seward Peninsula is very different, do you have genetic material from St. Lawrence Island? Because it looked like in the original map, there was a quite a large, that's a large island and um, mm -hmm. there's part of the range. And I just wondered if, if there's genetic material from St. Lawrence Island, if that matches with Seward Peninsula or if that, if that could be its own. We, you know, that's a great question. And I think they do have the samples for that and we didn't include them. Um, there were, yeah, there were people that went out there. They had some birds that they got um, in, um, I think the seabird die off that they had around that area. They weren't sure where the, or the, uh, where they came from. Sasha Backenstow works in our office and she helps to collect those along the, the coast of Marin Lambridge. Um, so they thought some of those might be um, birds from the island. And we do have those samples. We just didn't run them because it wasn't in the questions. For We had funding from the uh, NPRA and from the Park Service. So we had to kind of restrict this, where the samples were coming from. Right. But that's right. an excellent opportunity to pursue. It'd just be real interesting seeing that they come from wherever, South China or wherever they spend their winter. That was interesting, kind of caught my ear. Yeah, I, they're probably different. Maybe they're, they, they could be related to some of the Kam, um, Kamchatka birds. I don't know, right. good question. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, anyone else on the yellow billed loon? Um, there is a question, a question about... in the chat from Jim D. Oh, thanks, Letty. You're on it. It's great. Um, early in the program, you mentioned potential development in the Seward Peninsula. Curious with what development you had in mind. So um, some of the things that were identified in the conservation agreement were um, gravel extraction and road construction and um, we have the Ambler Road pushing through, and there have been rumblings, and who knows, this is just hand waving and rumblings, that rather than truck it all the way out to the Dalton Highway and then down to Valdez, they may want to take it to port and to the new port that might be constructed below Nome. So those are some things that I've heard being batted around. Um, I, I, you guys would probably be more in the know than me if any of that's actual an actual possibility, but. Personally, I haven't heard of, of, of sort of a backdoor way to make a road. I haven't heard of it. We certainly have gravel here in Nome, but um, maybe mm -hmm. someone else in the audience can address that, but I, not here. Um, my, anyone else, question? This is Letty, I have a question. Go ahead, Hi, Letty. Letty. Hi, uh, first of all, this is a great presentation, I think. Um, oh, thank so you. <laughs> when you mentioned and brought forth the awareness of the drying lakes, it's my understanding that between the Western Arctic Parklands and Bering Land Bridge, Bering Land Bridge National Preserve has significant amount of drying lakes occurring. And is this potentially gonna be a cause in terms of the nesting habitat 
that you could then petition to submit relisting for this for the bird through the Endangered Species Act? Yeah, that's a good question. So we brought it up. I attend the Loon Working Group meetings and um, we showed this information and we had Dave Swanson and Amy Larson speak, um, the experts on the permafrost and the lake drainage um, mechanisms at, at the meetings and everybody was very concerned. And there has been a little bit of lake drainage happening up north as well, but not to the extent that we see in Bering Landbridge because, you know, it's a peninsula and it's further south. And, um, and so, yeah, there are concerns about that. So um, that, that topic came up, but um, nobody, I, I think it, we don't know, it sounded to me like the collective wasn't sure if it was the time to do that yet. Like we wanna collect more information to see if this is really the case. So we're watching it. Dave and Amy are on it as well. Um, so we kind of have a team of people aware of it and all of the loon people in the state are aware of it. So we'll keep our eyes open because it doesn't only affect loons. Um, it was really heartbreaking because I was taking those pictures from the air and I was with Eric C and we're like, oh my gosh, you know, there's one, this one area had um, a couple big lakes that had drained and we had yellow billed loons that were left in a puddle <laughs> right next to a pair of swans. And I'm like, how are those guys going to get out of there, you know, they're gonna to have to hike a while to another big lake because these are big birds and they're heavy, loons are really awkward on land. And so I was just so worried about them being able to fly because they got to run on top of the water to, for like a quarter mile to take off. So <laughs> it was just, you know, it was an interesting thing, thing to see. Um, so we're, I think we're in a holding pattern but everybody's got their eye on it. Did the loons make it? Without their I don't know. Amy went back out in September to look because, um, so Dave also does vegetation work and it's been interesting. These lakes are draining so quickly. The mud is so full of um, wonderful things, you know, dead snails and rotting fish and things like that, that it's really beautiful for vegetation to grow in. And so they're turning over really quickly. A lot of times when lakes drain in a slower mechanism, a natural mechanism, it, it doesn't happen that quickly and there's little kettle ponds and things, but they drain and then they fill in with vegetation. So the next, Amy went out there in September and the, um, the lake was already starting to fill in with veg. And so those lakes are probably not going to recharge or fill again. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a fascinating thing we're seeing happening. All right. Um, I actually had a question too about um, all this with the draining lakes and the and the genetics and things. Is there much? Um, and maybe this is because you're federal. I don't know. But with Russia, are you are you able to? Are there loon research? Is there loon research going on on in Chukotka or or kind of across across the street from Seward Peninsula? Yeah. So um, Martin Robarts, who spoke in the video. He works for Wildlife Conservation Society. So he has been trying to bridge the gap and go over there and do research. And it's very limited because um, they can't, they don't have small aircraft there. They don't have um, little planes. They only have heli big helicopters, like military helicopters. And, and those aren't quite the right tool for the job. So a lot of the work that they're doing is ground-based. And so it's pretty limited in what they can reach. Um, so they, you know, drive out on, of all terrain vehicles and, and then they just hike around lakes um, as much as they can to get data. So they don't have an extensive um, system like we do where we have aerial surveys and we could cover more ground. Um, I expect a lot of the same things are probably happening there and they have a larger, you know, there's very little data but they have, if you look at the habitat, they have a larger landscape of course, it's a massive country with um, potentially a lot more landscape than we do. So there's probably a lot of birds there, but we just don't know much about them. They are doing some contaminants work with us though, with Mar through okay. Martin. Martin's our conduit. All right, well maybe we can, maybe we'll ask Martin if he can give You us should have him come. Yeah, yeah he's a great. great speaker. Um, and then there is a message in the chat, um, speaking of, of pollutants, um, and that's from Lou Tobin. He says, was the mercury pollution more elemental or organic? Um, it's um, the mercury that is 
toxic for birds is methylmercury. So it gets um, deposited as, as elemental mercury from the jet stream and then converts microbes in the water body itself convert it to methylmercury of the toxic form. So that's the component that the methylmercury is the meth mercury that um, Angela is measuring because that's toxic to organisms. And it's not a threshold yet, but it's getting there. Um, but she doesn't know if that's because um, the deposition sources are coming from other places and getting um, increasing or if it's, there's some natural sources in the area. So that's the next step to sort that out. All right. Well, thank you again, Melanie. Um, any last question for Melanie? All right. Well, I don't know. You guys are all um, off video. I see Pete. You have a question? <laughs> I had I had one. This is oh, Kate. hi, Kate. Um, yeah. Um, what typically drives the loss of the second egg? Well, a lot of times um, they just can't keep up with um, uh, sitting on the nest. So there's um, not only competition from other loons, usually um, both parents uh, will nurture the egg and sit on it or the, the nest, um, then they take turns. But it's a lot of work because they're, they've got to patrol to keep other birds away. And then they have a problem because um, there's a lot of nest predation from foxes and glaucus skulls and, and terns and other things that as soon as they're off that nest, they go for it. So um, nest, uh, yellow balloons are some of the most tenacious nesters I've ever met. Um, you know, they will stick on that nest when you fly over and they'll just look up, look up at you with their bill when the other loons will kind of dive off and, um, and escape underwater. And so um, it's, I think it's just a lot of work to pull it off. Um, often one year when we had um, a delay from weather and there was a lot of rain and there was a lot of snow melt, we went out two days later. We usually... Um, patrol first to see where the eggs are so we can go collect them for contaminants and we have to figure out if we can land the plane there and stuff um, so we were delayed two days getting back there and um, four of the nests were flooded because water levels had come up and so we went and uh, actually reached around the nest and we found a couple of eggs that had gotten pushed off into the lake so there's I think it's hard to be um, a yellow-billed moon egg <laughs> Sometimes too, there's footage from the North Slope um, from, from the folks that work at ABR, Alaska Biological Research. They're doing, they do a lot of groundwork and camera work. And um, if the wind shifts and there's a, a pan of ice in the middle of the lake, it can get pushed over and go over the top of the nest too. So um, it's just tough. It's tough to, uh, to hatch out eggs and it's tough to keep the chicks alive <laughs> as well. All right. Hi, Janet. I see you. Do you have a question for Melanie? Sorry, I have a puppy and she's, she's playing with her bull. <laughs> That's okay. We've all got, we're all used to it. And this is Zoom, age of Zoom. <laughs> Janet, did you, have, did you have a question? Well, it does sound like a pretty bad ratio. If there's two parents and they raise maybe one egg a year, that's a pretty, that's not the greatest reproductive rate. No, it's not. It's not. That's, that's one of the things that's really uh, a life history trait that's dinging them. They do get, the babies do get a lot of parental care after that, you know, and that's great, like humans, but um, it's a hard living. It's hard to pull it off. This summer we had seemingly, at least in this, this half of the Seward Peninsula, we had almost drought-like conditions with lack of rain. We're, we're getting rain now, but we were very dry Wow! for a while, or at least our rivers were very low. We had very warm temperatures in May and June, uh, kind of record-breaking heat. And in the 114-year data set that Nome has, we lost our snow melt early. Our rivers went very dry and then... Wow. I think if there's anybody else in Nome, speak up on this, but I, I think we were in very, very low, right up until recently, very low water. 
and you were saying about draining lakes and the variability of the lakes um, water level is troublesome for them. So I, I would think this very low water, did you see that? We, you know, unfortunately- well, it was different up in, the, up in the northern edge, I don't know. Um, yeah, we didn't, we didn't fly this year, oh, we were right. supposed to, okay. but because of COVID, we couldn't get in the planes. And right. so, yeah, it's really, I mean, Dave Swanson was really worried about that. <laughs> he was like, we got to go and see what's going on. Um, so, yeah. Well, though, I, it was very, very dry uh, summer with this very big heat wave that was sustained in the spring. And it took that snow melt right out. And then, wow. and then July and August were actually kind of cold, <laughs> cooler than normal here. Wow. And then... Um, but our river stayed very low. Wow. Yeah, there's some, you guys are seeing the changes. I mean, we all are in Alaska, but you guys are out there sticking out in the ocean. <laughs> yeah, you're seeing it the most, yeah. Oof. All right, well, thank you again so much. I don't know how people clap when their screens are dark, but you're getting some nice, um, you're getting some nice chat. I don't know if you can see that on your phone. Okay, I'll check it out. But I want to thank you all for your patience with me and my, um, and my challenges with Zoom. And thank you so much, um, Gay, for stepping in and rescuing me. I appreciate it. You're awesome. Yeah. Oh well, right you're now. you're cool under fire. I gotta say, <laughs> I gotta say. So yeah, well, if you want to stick around so I can thank you properly, that that would be great. Um, but I think at this point is that if no one has anything else, you can put in the chat box. It's on the bottom bar with a little um, talking bubble it says chat. Click on that and you can type in good, bad, or ugly. You can go anonymous, I think, um, for Melanie. <laughs> <laughs> so have at it. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. And next Thursday is going to be Peter Murphy, NOAA Marine Debris Program. And he's gonna be talking about the, the event that we're having, this trash, unfortunate foreign debris event that is striking us region, region wide. And, and Melanie, I, I'll tell you that trash is flushed north and is now on the shore between Wales and Shishmaref. And it is impressive. I flew up there. Oh my gosh. And it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's impressive. Uh, there was a, for, for, for someone who's not used to seeing trash on that particular stretch. Oh no. Coastline. Oh gosh! Yeah. Uh, Thanks for letting me know that. Yeah, well, we, that's another thing we're going to do is microplastics. Angela does; um, she's a contaminants um, expert. She does microplastic stuff, and that's the next thing we were going to take to the Loon Group to start looking into. You're going to cheer us up. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you know we it. know because we don't want, you know, um, loons eat the fish, and the fish eat. Um, you know, the stuff that's in the bottom of the lakes or the water bodies or the lagoons and that stuff moves up the chain. So we don't want it to get into people either, you know. So we can use our loons as sentinels for not only the ecosystem, the lake ecosystem, but for subsistence people. You know, that's really important. Subsistence use is, is real in the, on yellowbill loons in the Bering Strait region, that's for sure. So I, I yeah. think that's great you're looking at that, the contaminants and the plastics. It is important. Yeah, well, we're going to start. That's the next grant. <laughs> all right. Anyway, well, thanks, everybody. Thank you from Fairbanks. Yeah, for all coming, and we'll hopefully see you Thursday, next Thursday on the 24th. Bye. People are sticking in. They're holding in. Holding on. <laughs> well, anyway, before I turn this off, I, um, unless they have something else to say, I just wanted to say thank you so much. And um, um, hopefully we can get you back, maybe down the line when you're able to resume your, your um, flying when this COVID thing is over. It's very mm -hmm. interesting. I wasn't kidding about the silver lining. Normally, we would never see you. And we would do these. We do these in person on campus and here at Northwest Campus. But of course, this isn't Northwest Campus, and we're not we're not having people on campus really very often. It's it's very controlled, so um, we're not able to do these gatherings. And uh, it's actually we wouldn't have normally had you, but it's really great we did. So thank well, you. Well, it's funny you said that because I was talking to Letty and um, a couple other people about trying to come through Nome, Jeanette, and um, because I feel like I, I, you know, I neglected you guys and I didn't mean to. So when you asked me, I was like, this is great. I can 
you know, yeah, reach oh, out to awesome. you guys as well. I don't want to neglect people. Yeah. No, and, and it's really pertinent to the region. I've got two dogs that you probably saw them. And so I can totally relate with a puppy. <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, all right. Well, I will shut her down. Carol.